Hey, everybody. Welcome to 3 Minute Thursday. Straw Source, Vandal Rights, News and Gossip, all packed into a short sweet three minutes on everyone's favorite day, a Thursday. And I'm back. What can I say? It's nice to be back. I got the background. I'm in the office. I got the things. I'm making the videos with you. I appreciate all this. And I'm stoked to be back. Um, but it's not going to it's not going to last very long. So I know you're all thinking, is the title clickbait or is it real? And the answer is yes. Do you ever get a straight answer out of me? Come on. But let me tell you what's going on in, in a much longer story that I'm that I'm sure you're, you're really interested in, but I'm gonna tell it to you anyways. Back when I was in prison, and if you're new to the channel, I was sentenced to four years in prison for, for my activism. If you wanna know about it, check it out up here, but otherwise, it, it, whatever. And when I was in there, I subscribed to Backpacker Magazine because I loved, uh, and I still love, backpacking and camping and hiking and being outdoors and being in the wilderness and all that sort of thing. And in that magazine, there'd be all sorts of like routes and, and trails and hikes and trips. And I'd take the ones that I was interested in, I'd rip them out and I'd put them in the this folder and I keep it in my locker for for years, you know, as kind of like a, you know, when you get out, you can do these things. There's good things waiting for you when you get out. But one of the ones I always held on to and I kept reading about and wanting to do is called the John Muir Trail, which is about 211 miles, which goes between Happy Isles in Yosemite National Park to Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the contiguous United States. 211 miles, you start at one side and you go to the other side and it's amazing. It's supposed to be one of the most beautiful trails in the country. And I just read about it and looked at these pictures over and over again in these magazines. I really wanted to do it. And here I am 10 plus years later and I'm finally getting the opportunity to do it. So I'm taking it. So I'm gonna do about 235 miles, um, hopefully um, starting at the beginning of September. And so I'm gonna be gone for that period of time, completely offline, not making videos, not doing that. So am I leaving? Yes. Am I coming back? Yes. When am I coming back? I don't know. There's also a bunch of fires. Thanks, climate change. Um, uh, all in the area and the smoke is kind of bad and the air quality isn't that great. But the point is I could be back in a few days, I could be back at the end of the month. I don't know. But if you're familiar with social media and how algorithms work, doing this type of thing is not great for uh, my channel. But that's all right, because self-care, we talk about it all the time, you know. That being said, if you like what you're seeing, if you're enjoying the channel, if you want it to keep going, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, please share it, please comment, please like, all those silly things to keep the algorithm aware that I'm still here. I'm trying to um, edit a couple things that I've shot uh, over the last month or two that I'm really excited about, including episode 11 of My Friends Do the Coolest Shit, where I um, interviewed my friend, uh, Leslie James Pickering. He was one of the spokespeople for the Earth Liberation Front um, in the early part of the 21st century. He has a lot of amazing stories, a lot of inspiring stories, a lot of stories you're gonna be like, wait, what, that really happened? Um, so go and check it out when that comes out. Again, make sure you like it, share it, comment, all that stuff. So Fred, three or four weeks off, what are you gonna do with your uh, your vacation? Crypto, you're starting your own cryptocurrency. Amazing. Fred D. Cordova starting his own cryptocurrency. Cordova Crypto, that's got a nice ring to it. Okay, that intro was it was a hefty one. Went on for quite some time. But I, there's a lot of things I want to talk about, um, particularly Camp Beagle. I'm really excited about Camp Beagle. If people aren't familiar with it, it is a camp that has been set up outside of MBR Acres, which is a breeding facility in the UK. They breed beagles for vivisection, and then they ship them all over, um, and then they are tortured and killed inside of laboratories. A campaign has started up uh, called Free the MBR Beagles, if I'm not mistaken, where their protest outside of the facility has now turned into a camp. It's, it's really inspiring to see. It really has taken me back to what got me interested and excited in pressure campaigns, which was the Consort Beagle Breeder campaign, the Hellgrove Cat Farm campaign. And now we're kind of seeing a resurgence of that in the UK. Uh, it, it's sparking a lot of excitement, um, a lot of interest, a lot of activism, uh, grassroots activism, and in large part due to this campaign and this particular camp. I'm excited to talk to Mel Broughton. If you're not familiar with Mel, he's done all sorts of stuff from running pressure campaigns to um, doing stuff with the Animal Liberation Front, including trying to free a, a dolphin from a, an aquarium by putting him in a stretcher and trying to walk him back in the ocean. It's, ama it's an amazing story. If you don't know it, I interviewed him a while back about that. Check it out. But anyways, he is now at Camp Beagle, um, and he was gracious enough to give us a little background on what's going on and what's happening now with MBR Acres trying to get litigation pass to stop the camp. What are the updates? Let's hear what Mel's got to say. We were in court last week, obviously. Uh, you know about that. Um, right. And we've managed to uh, uh, maintain the camp here. Uh, a Camp Beagle came out of um, a campaign that had already started against uh, MBR Acres uh, over here in uh, Cambridgeshire. And basically what happened was uh, demonstrations were happening here every week with four or five people uh, for probably the last 12, 14 months. There was some undercover uh, a footage expose of, of um, uh, what was happening here at MBR Acres. And that 
actually got into the national press. Shortly after that, we had a demonstration here on the Sunday. About 50 people turned out. It was quite lively. And mm. uh, some people just said, well, we're not going. We're not leaving. And literally, uh, they stayed here overnight in their cars. Within a few days, other people arrived. Tents arrived. Uh, and more and more people came. And Camp Beagle was born. Uh, and now, six weeks in, if you were to stand uh, on the roadside here now and look each way, all you can see are tents and cars. Uh, uh, this is this whole encampment with banners stretched all along the roads. Uh, it's quite a sight because I can tell you, you know, for the last year I was here, um, you know, five, six of us, we never saw anybody. And now there's a small city here right. of animal rights people demanding an end to MBR acres and, and the freeing of the beagles. So, um, yeah, it, it kind of grew organically uh, out, out of a small campaign. Uh, and what it's done, it's it's literally now um, reached out to people across the country. I mean, people come here from all over the country. It gets massive support from local people who bring food every day, uh, water and other supplies. And it's become an entity in itself uh, that is focusing attention on this place where these beagles are being bred uh, to be sold to labs. It, it's a phenomenon. It's an absolute phenomenon that, that we haven't seen the like of this in the UK for probably two decades now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really sort of brought the animal rights movement right bang back central again, which is you know incredible. I was wondering if it, if it does feel like like the beginning of something big again uh, around vivisection um, and and particularly like on reflecting back on Consort and Hillgrove. Like, does it feel like it's almost a revival of that again? It does. It does feel like a revival, but I, I, I think also there's some differences with this. Uh, the issue of vivisection or animal research had pretty much been killed off in this country. Mm -hmm. um, there was very little happening. But what's happened with this is it's kind of brought it right back again. People are talking about uh, vivisection in this country now. People, animal rights people are talking about it. Whereas before the last couple of decades, the only thing that people really talked about was veganism. Right. Animal rights and certainly animal research had literally been pushed right into the shadows. But now it's right back out there. Uh, because of what's happening here. And, and that's really exciting. It's, it's re-energised the animal rights movement. And it's also a stepping stone. I mean, the kind of pressure that can now be applied on the whole of the animal research industry because of what's happening here is enormous. What I would call the grassroots animal rights movement is now very energised off the back of what's happening here uh, at Camp Beagle and Free the MBR Beagles campaign. Yeah, like you said, a resurgence of the grassroots animal rights movement, what we can do as a small community when we come together. And I think that's, that's super exciting. Um, I, I think it's... That's exactly it. I mean, what we're seeing is people working together, putting all of the differences aside for, for a common goal. And that's really exciting because I, I think once you reach that stage, anything's possible. And, you know, I, I, you know I, I follow you on social media, of course, and, you know, I've seen pictures of you standing outside of various laboratories over the years, sometimes by yourself, sometimes with one other person, sometimes with two other people. Um, and, and just seeing that, like, you know, you and a handful have really been trying to keep the dissection at the forefront of people's minds and, and now getting to see you standing there with hundreds of people is just, I don't know, it's, it's exciting to me. And I'm, I'm super thankful for the, I'm not, for the work that I'll you're doing. I'll be honest with you, I, I, I'm not a very emotional person normally, but I have got quite emotional over this simply because of, of what's happened. Um, and I, I really did think that we were going to struggle to ever get this issue back out there. Uh, and I've been proved wrong. I've been proved wrong. And I'm so happy to be proved wrong. It's an amazing campaign. I'll drop some links down below if you want to follow along. Um, they're primarily from what I found on, on Instagram and their Camp Beagles and Free MBR Beagles. Um, so check it out down below. Let's move on to Ann Arbor, Michigan. Why are we moving on to Ann Arbor, Michigan? That's the question in everyone's mind. Well, they have banned the sale of fur. I'm excited by these towns and these cities that are taking these initiatives to start pushing uh, fur out of those cities and making it harder and harder for this industry to survive. It's important that we attack these places from all different angles, whether that's these um, pressure campaigns being done by CAFT and other anti-fur activists around the country, to people passing uh, laws and getting bans placed on the sale of fur or the production of fur or fur farms, like what's going on in British Columbia with Ban Fur Farms British Columbia, who are doing great work up there, to Liza Oliver, who I interviewed a while back, who got a ban put in place in her town of Wesley, Massachusetts, and now working on a state ban. It's exciting to see all these different angles being used to finally put pressure on the fur industry in, in, in hopes that it will collapse. 
I have to admit, after going to Europe for several years, uh, you know, and seeing what they were doing with fur over there, um, getting these bans passed, getting, you know, fur farms banned in their entire countries, um, getting the sale of fur banned, all these different things going on over there. I just thought, what has happened in the United States? We've totally dropped the ball on fur. And if we're not doing this on a global scale, we're going to lose. And it feels like the grassroots movement here in the United States has really picked up that baton and run with it. And we are catching up big time uh, with this fight against fur in, in really big ways. So to everyone working on fur issues out there, not just in the United States, but around the globe, thank you. You're making a difference and it's super exciting to see. All right, time to move on to a new segment, which I've entitled stories that will make you ask the question, who will wipe us off the face of the earth first, the earth or ourselves? We've heard a lot about the dairy industry uh, really on its last legs, but thanks to COVID, the United States government is giving the uh, dairy industry in the U.S. another $350 million, $350 million to, to bail them out. Once again, nah, I'm going to be generous and say that I think a lot of us here understand that the dairy industry isn't collapsing primarily because of animal rights activists and vegan outreach. It's predominantly people that are realizing that like dairy isn't good for the environment, isn't good for their health, and then they're switching to other things, uh, including non-dairy milks, but also predominantly to water um, and energy drinks. That being said, $350 million brought in by the U.S. government to give the dairy industry to help them out is just preposterous. But the question for me always is like, do we continue doing vegan outreach knowing that maybe it's not doing everything we think it's doing around the dairy industry? Or we could get some inspiration from people like Connie Spence from Liberation 360, who I got this story from, um, who's working on going after subsidies. Obviously, I don't think it's an either or. I think it needs to be both. But I do think we have to continue down that path of doing pressure campaigns and putting pressure on the government, putting pressure on our representatives to really start to cancel out these subsidies. Because if we can't make huge leaps and bounds with our vegan outreach, these industries are going to continue to get bailed out with these $350 million and beyond uh, amounts of money that are just astronomical. And we just, we just simply can't compete with that right now. You're welcome for that, Cherie News. And you thought it ended there. Let's move on to Mexico, where tens of thousands of cows are dying uh, and starving to death because of drought. Is this the earth taking us all out or uh, ourselves taking? Or is it a little bit of both? I don't really know in this one. But the fact of the matter is like tens of thousands of cows are dying because there's not enough food to eat for them because the drought has been wiping out water and wiping out crops. But it does feel like a little bit of a canary in the coal mine. Am I, am I allowed to say that as a vegan? I, I don't know what the alternative would be. Canary in the coal I don't know. But this isn't going to be an isolated incident, right? Uh, this has happened in the past. This is happening now and it's escalating and it's going to get worse and worse and worse, which means to me, once again, we need to revisit that question of like, do we go after environmentalists because they're not vegan or do, re or do we realize that like it's going to take all of us together to really hammer away at this climate crisis? Because regardless if people are vegan or not, these cows are going to be dying and these farm animals are going to be dying at massive rates on top of climate refugees, on top of catastrophic weather situations, on top of all these other issues that are just going on in the world because of climate crisis. We either got to start coming together to, to change things systematically, systemically, and, and focus a little bit less on people's individual diets, or we're just going to keep seeing these things continue over and over and over again. And that seems really terrible. Uh... Is there something a little more uplifting we could talk about here for it? Uh, possibly? Okay, well, let's try this one out. Uh, there was a new study that came out that indicated that eating one hot dog will take 36 minutes off of your life. Eee. So does that mean like misanthropic vegans, you know, the ones that are like against nature and like want to kill off carnivores and things like that, does that mean that like they're going to start rethinking their position on vegan outreach? And maybe like start to like become champions of the hot dog industry in hopes of just like knocking these people off a little bit earlier. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen here. But the study was a little more interesting that in my opinion. It, it was it was done by the University of Michigan that analyzed 5,800 different foods and, 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 and like ranked them by like a health burden. Like, you know, will this food give you a uh, risk of like heart disease or cancer, uh, cardiovascular diseases? And they also put in like an environmental issue as well, like um, how much of an impact will this food have on the environment? And with that, they were able to like calculate minutes taken off or added to your life, depending on the food. You're, I don't know. It's, it's math. It's science. You know, who needs it? 
But some of the interesting things that came out in the study was that they said that uh, swapping 10% of your daily calories from beef and processed meats towards fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes um, could potentially lead to health improvements such as gaining 48 minutes of healthy life per day. So it's like 10% uh, vegan diet gives you 48 minutes a day. So 100% to give you 480 extra minutes of life. I don't really know. This is why I don't do these type of studies. But uh, it sounds good. Interestingly, it says if you eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you can add up to 33 minutes to your life. I enjoy a good peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I would enjoy adding an additional 33 minutes to my uh, life expectancy. At the end of the day, the study basically indicates that like you eat healthy, you eat good foods, you eat predominantly a plant-based diet, you're gonna live longer. And if you eat a bunch of processed meats and dead animals and dairy, eh, not so much. I think it's something you and I already know, but I thought it was kind of interesting how they added like timestamps to it. I was like, eh, Joey Chestnut, the champion hot dog eater, that dude's in big trouble. Well, that pretty much wraps it up. I'll be gone for the most of September. Hopefully you all will keep doing what you're doing whether that's self-care, whether that's activism, whether that's campaigning, whether that's living your life, whether that's a little bit of everything, but hopefully each and every one of us will continue to keep fighting.